Buongiorno, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. What a beautiful place. Italy is a beautiful place. I have to, you know, we have a vacation home right around the corner in Lugano, so it's a you know, different country, but same thing. So it's really great to be here. Um, first of all, I want to say, uh, many of you know the future is already here. We just haven't noticed. I mean, if you go into other countries like Silicon Valley or China, you know, robotics and all these things are already part of our lives. And, you know, predictions have it that uh, robotics will be as common as using WhatsApp in 10 years. So if we look around our world, I mean, clearly, if you have any mobile device like this, this is your external brain. Right? This is your second brain. Uh, in many ways, we keep our data here, we do our dating here, right? we have our music here at Spotify, we have our films here, we have our news, we do our banking, and this machine has the same power than a mainframe computer that the President of the United States was using 20 years ago. And in 10 years, this machine will have a million times the capacity of computing. Right? So it's hard to imagine this future. I mean, we're talking about a, a time frame that we have to really understand what it means. So my work is... Uh, based on the idea of saying, well, not predicting the future, but uh, developing foresight. Here's the most important curve of the day, the exponential curve. Uh, you've heard about this before, of course, Moore's law, Metcalfe's law, and so on. But the reality really is this. You know, in the beginning of this curve, you notice nothing, like the paperless office, not, not much changes. When you get to the takeoff point, that's today. You're at four. The next step is eight, 16, 32. In less than seven years, we're going to be at 128, and in 30 steps, it's a billion. So our curve is going here. From here, you see basically the changes in the next 10 years will be mind-boggling. I'll tell you why. But vertically up in 30 years, a billion, that means the kids of my kids will never know how to drive a car themselves. Right? They will never know what a book looks like. That's kind of sad. They will definitely not know what a CD looks like. They live in a wholly different world. And so if you run business today, you have to actually be good at seeing the future. Because the chances are in five or seven years, your company will make money in completely different ways. You know, I used to be in the music business. Uh, I was a musician and then producer. And today, music is no longer about selling music. Uh, music is basically free. You know, YouTube, of course. Spotify, you guys are using Spotify, I'm sure. What a, what a gift, right? 20 million songs for eight euros or 10 euros a month. You know, it used to cost 20 euros for one CD with 12 songs. Right? So if you're in the music business, you're no longer selling music. You're selling what? Uh, access, experience, context. That's going to happen to everyone, to banking, to insurance, maybe even to government. Right? It's going to happen that these changes are mind-boggling. If you just look at some of the graphs, if you're in the media business, I hope you're not in the media business, but that's really the hardest place. So I look, look at this graph. Right? Google and Facebook are making 90% of the digital money of advertising. 90%. Talk about exponential. The change, if you're in the car business, transportation, logistics, advanced battery technology, <coughs> hugely exponential. As I like to say, science fiction is becoming science fact. In a couple of years, we'll be able to drive our car 2,000 kilometers on one charge. In 10 years, there'll probably be one charge when you buy the car and it will cost one-tenth of the money. Ex uh, uh, exponential change of artificial intelligence, mind-boggling explosion of how that's happening in commercial use of artificial intelligence, generally the accelerating growth in technology. So that basically means this, keep it very simple. In 10 years, nothing is impossible anymore. Pretty much nothing. Genetic engineering of humans, possible. Beating cancer, give it a bit more time, 20 years maybe. Artificial language understanding, if we can speak to computers, that's one or two years from today. You know, there's already 35% uh, of American kids, they speak to their computer. They don't type. Language recognition is just about perfect. So in the next few years, you'll see customer service. Basically, you speak to a computer, like we do already you know, with the Amazon Echo, right? and you just say, hey, I need insurance. And you speak to the computer like a friend. To a, that's the idea. I mean, strange ideas, basically science fiction becoming science fact. The best example is energy. On the left, you have the OPEC graph. You know, OPEC is the other guys that make the oil, run the oil, take the oil out, right? Of course, their graph says we're going to use oil forever. 
obviously they make it, right? That's in their interest. But here, right, the graph of solar energy, this is a little bit optimistic. It basically says in 20 years we can cover the world's energy needs with solar energy. And most scientists are saying, yeah, that's, that's probably accurate. Maybe 25 years, it's the end of oil. We're still going to use oil, but the oil companies are the next music companies. I mean, think about that change. We're talking about $7 trillion of, of uh, fossil fuel. Yeah. So that's quite a, quite a bump in the road. So which one do you believe when you talk about science fiction, science fact? Right? We have robotics. We've seen that. They can act like people. Right? This is Boston, Boston Dynamics right? and this one. the world's first autonomous aerial flying vehicle. Of course, guess where? In Dubai. <laughs> where else? <laughs> I mean, if they're going to lose the oil, they have to do something, right? So now they do this, I suppose. I, I don't think I would take a test flight in this, but be my guest, you know? especially not in Rome. Uh, but you know, who knows? So basically what's happening is that now we're living in a world where we have to do two things. We have to think of the old business, and then we have to think of the new business. If you're an oil company, you're lucky today, 84% of the world's supply of energy is fossil fuels. Coal, gas, oil, and nuclear to some degree. You know that in 20 years, it's going to be over here. Now, this is a huge pain. Imagine that. I mean, uh, Shell and ExxonMobil have already announced transition plans. And the, the country of Saudi Arabia has said they want to transition to a new economy without oil. I don't know how they're ever going to do that. I suppose it's a golf economy or something. But, but, so this is a huge challenge, right? But this is happening to every business. Now we have to say, how do we make money today? Tomorrow it could be vastly different. If you're a car maker, you know the, you know the story, right? If you make cars, what are you going to do tomorrow? You, you won't sell cars. You will sell mobility. And that's a substantial change of business model. If you're a bank, what are you going to sell tomorrow? You become a platform for transactions. So that is a huge shift that we're seeing around the world. The future is no longer an extension of the present. Very important to remember. And all the hard work we've put in to make it as good as it is today may be kind of useless in several years because all of a sudden the context has changed. It could or could not be, you know, have different impact depending on the industry, but clearly we're heading into the future. The music business, again, here's the example, what's called the valley of death. You know, people stop buying CDs, stop buying iTunes. You see the red, the red uh, bar here is people streaming music, like most of you do now. I mean, in fact, I would say if you buy a CD for your kids for Christmas, they will call a therapist. Because right? they think you're completely lost. Right? Music is basically clicking a button and it just plays. But here's the big deal. If you look at the music business, it's no longer the record companies that will own the future. The new guys are Spotify and YouTube and Baidu and Facebook. And, right? So that's the lesson to learn from the music business. And that's a hard lesson to understand because we're going into the future that is exponentially different. This is the wave of change, I like to say. If you're in the media business, you're already in that. If you're in the uh, in the e-commerce business, of course, the mobile phone business, and of course, the car business. But waiting on the beach, education, banking, energy, insurance. If you run an energy company or a bank, look at the music business, that's what's going to happen to you. Um, if you're lucky, you can respond better. Because nobody more stupid than the music companies in their reaction are basically saying that we don't want this to happen, we're going to prevent it. That, this, is, this is definitely happening. I mean, music is now in the cloud, so you have to think about how you're going to go into this digital future. If you have kids, you need to think about what your kids are going to learn in this future. This is the convergence of man and machine, as we heard earlier. Uh, in parenthesis, convergence, of course, I'll explain shortly. Uh, but we have to do this. We have to observe and understand what goes on. If you don't spend 5 to 10% of your time observing, you're going to miss the boat. This has to be part of your job, is to observe the key things. The other one is to understand. 
You know, when you speak to a computer, one of those intelligent machines like uh, Siri or others or Cortana, they're getting better and better all the time, and they will get perfect. But there's one thing that they can't do is to understand what hasn't been said. And the most important things between people are those that are not being said. So when you meet somebody in the hallway, it takes less than, than uh, one second to understand the other person without any communication. That's what humans do, 40 quadrillion calculations per second. And these things are not actually calculations, right? They are, I, I don't know what they are, emotions, I suppose. Right? So this is what your future is. Machines will do all the work that are routine jobs. And I literally mean all the work. Low-level banking, advice, fast food, checkout supermarket, bookkeepers, planes, pilots. Well, it'd be hard to figure out how you're going to fly in a plane without, with a robot, you know. That's a social question. But this is what we're going to do in the future. This is our job, is to understand things. That's why you're here. And understanding is much more than computing, as was said earlier. The other thing is we have to imagine what the future looks like. Without imagination, there is no future. And try to get a machine to imagine things. I think it can be done, but it, it's quite a bit away. Again, if you have kids, teach them how to imagine stuff rather than to plan stuff. And last one is to have foresight. Talking about leadership, right? Today, you have to lead into that future. You have to lead your clients into the future. So the question I have for you, are you future ready? It doesn't take much. A lot of people are worried about the future because they feel like defenseless or, or they can't catch up. Or, right? But if you do this, I think you'll be safe just going along with the future and, and defining it the best future that you want. So we must, in that uh, idea, think back from the future. If you have a bank or an insurance company today or if you run government, you don't want to go forward from today and just put little future things on top. You look into the future five years from now and you come back with what it will be. That's the new business, the pearl of hybrid thinking. It's very important. So I want to introduce you to the mega shifts. Uh, incidentally, I think all of you have received a copy of my new book, Technology versus Humanity. So all the answers are in there, of course, and I ask lots of questions as well. But there's a whole chapter on the mega shifts. And this is how you can future-proof your company. The mega shifts are these. There's quite a few. I won't go through all of them. These are huge opportunities for us. And everybody's talking about digital transformation and digitization. This is just the first of 10. And in the meantime, since I wrote the book, I've made 20. <laughs> so it's just time is exploding. Uh, take this one, right? datafication. Everything around us that used to be stupid is becoming data. Cars, pipelines, sensors, smart city, smart farming. Right? And with that becomes a cognification that machines can start to actually understand. Well, think about these things. Automation. Automation is a much bigger, bigger factor in society than globalization has ever been. But don't fear, you know, I think it's fine if we automate the routine jobs. We just have to make new ones. And we have to spread the benefit of automation to the society. Imagine a world where everything is automated, where your telephone company, Tim, or whatever it would be here, can automate 80% of their work. And they will. Are they going to keep the money? They're going to pay an automation tax? Should they pay an automation? I don't know. Nobody likes taxes. Well, some people, but hard question. So all the stuff that's happening here is augmentation of humans and, and this idea of virtualization. These are all good things, but they can also be terrible things. So finding a balance becomes crucial because technology is extremely powerful. The main thing is we're moving into the age of smart machines. And I'm talking, I'm talking about smart machines like smart computers. I'm talking about machines that can actually program themselves to understand what is going on. Thinking machines. Let's make no mistake about this. These machines are not thinking like we are thinking. Not at all. They're thinking in their own way. They're thinking like machines. You know, we think with our body, as was said earlier. And this is very important to keep in mind the difference between those two things. If you're looking at this graph, you see how our world has changed? The age of tech. On the left, it used to be all the oil companies and the banks that were the most powerful companies in the world. Today, 
Who is the most powerful company? Well, it's obvious, right? Technology, platforms, digitization. That's our future. And that's going to be a huge shift in our society in many ways. I think I call this sometimes a smart converter. You know? Basically, whatever business you're in, all you have to do is put smart in front of it and put it through the converter. And that's the future. Smart city, smart banking, that's an oxymoron. Uh, smart science. And I mean, this is something that we're seeing all around us, and it's basically based on this idea that data is the new oil. Right? I've said this for 15 years, and that's what you see around us. And this is, what, of course, what SAP does, right? looking at working with data. So very powerful opportunity here, something that we're going to see unfold in a very large way in the, in the near future. So let's talk about artificial intelligence. Uh, this is a Wikipedia definition, very simple. Right? Something that usually requires human <laughs> intelligence that can be emulated by machines. Very simple. I could talk about that for three hours, but this is what happens in, his, in history. The machines can tabulate that are programmed, machines that can think, that are cognitive. IBM calls it cognitive computing. It's very good for marketing. We're not really sure what exactly that means, but uh, machines that can actually simulate what we're doing. And the uh, CEO of Google said, keeps on saying, we're going into a world that is no longer about just mobile, the telefonini, the smartphone, right? but about artificial intelligence. Every single company in the next five years will use computing power to get smarter, quicker, more efficient, and basically change the world using artificial intelligence. Now, if we use mobile phones, we use artificial intelligence in a, in a simpler way. And of course, robotics do. So here's the challenge. The human cards that we're holding, these are very old cards, but they hadn't really changed very much. Ethics, values, beliefs, assumptions, emotions, compassion. You know, they're, they're down here, and technology has a new card every week. There's a new card. You know, geoengineering, nanotechnology, you know, uploading your brain to the internet, you know, simple things like that. But basically, intelligent machines will change our world more than anything else we've seen develop in the last 50 years. And I would tell you, I think 90% of that is extremely positive. We can change global warming. We can fix the energy problem. We can solve diseases. But there are 10, you know, there are 10 percent left here that are issues like privacy, data protection, application. And we have to watch that as well, because the problem is, of course, the, this is, you know, if you're my age, you are going to see this. This is not that far away. This is years, not decades. It's already here. So this is not to scare you. I think this is a fantastic opportunity, but we have to put it in with a balance of a sort to say, well, what exactly are we doing in this conversions of man and machine? How far should we take this? If I ask you personally, how far would you go? Would you like to connect your brain to the internet so you can think faster? If you're a professor, would you like a Wikipedia implant? If you're a doctor, would you like to have virtual reality glasses that can see every operating room in the world? would be fantastic. I mean, imagine. Imagine you could think a thousand times as fast. Who would not want to do that? It's a super drug, you could say, huh? permanent legal drug. But who decides this? Who is mission control for humanity? Well, you know who it is right now. <coughs> Silicon Valley. Everything that we do gets one way or the other decided in Silicon Valley or in China. So right now we're operating under a framework of legal rights of the US as far as security and data protection is concerned. So that's a very big question for us. How can we make that safe in the future? And then the question is really, when we think about us, is human existence, what they call in German Dasein, which is really the best word to explain it, is human thinking and existence, is it actually computable? Are, are humans just fancy data? Here's the key question. The CEO of IBM says, every important decision in five years will not be done by intuition or experts, but by thinking machines, which they happen to sell, of course. It makes good sense, right? But this is a key question. Well, I think really the, the reality is really this, right? We think like this. And we don't even know how that happens. We think with the body. 
So let's not be afraid of thinking machines because we can use them. But we shouldn't let them do what we're supposed to do. And this is a very important distinction. Huh? We have to keep in mind where we're going with this. JP Morgan has software now developed for contracts. And this is going to happen absolutely everywhere. If your business is very complicated today, and tomorrow it will be a contract machine that has learned it from you. That's in some cases five, seven, ten years away. That's not a bad thing. I mean, who really likes to do the routine, you know, monkey work, really? But still, it's a job. Huh? A job is a job. So what would that mean in Italy, where we already don't have enough jobs? The key question is, what should not be automated, and what should be automated? This is a moral, ethical, political, social decision, not just a technology decision. I mean, this is a decision that we have to make together to figure out what the future holds and where we're going with this, because technology is what I call hell then, you know, hell and heaven. Technology can work in both ways. Right now, we're at the 1090 status, kind of. Uh, since Trump, we're at 2080, but uh, just... Um, but we don't want the 10% to be 50. That would be a very, very bad world. Right? We're going to need some sort of balance, something that makes it work for us to actually find the decision. Because here's the thing, technology is morally neutral until we use it. And it's our job in business is to say, we're going to use this for the good of our customers and of society. Because ultimately, you know, customers are not machines, they're people. And they, they are your customers because of trust and because of relationship, not because of a, some stupid algorithm. Right? You're going to use the algorithm to make it better, of course. So that's really the challenge for us, you know, where we go with this. For our own jobs, it really means this. Anything that can be digitized, automated, virtualized, or robotized will be. That is what I call digital Darwinism. That's just as certain as now you have electronic books, electronic newspapers, and Spotify. Same thing. But here's the flip side. Anything that cannot be becomes extremely valuable. And what cannot be automated? Well, this is 98% of our lives. Mistakes, lies, accidents, invention, compassion, emotions, empathy, creativity. Yeah, you can say a computer can learn that, and they, they probably can. But they can only serve it on one channel. You know, the channel says, I'm going to be compassionate. But it's, it doesn't really exist, right? So it's completely different. Let's keep that in mind where we're going, especially when you have kids, right? Where we are going with this. A lot of people are saying, this is going to be a problem. We'll become useless humans. Great book, uh, Homo Deus, that some of you may have seen, talks about this. I don't think we're going to be useless humans. I think we're going to be able to take technology and move up the food chain. I think most of our jobs will be automated so that we can create new value, human value, human-only value. Remember, the purpose of business is not automation. The purpose of business is not efficiency. Efficiency is for robots. Your CFO would love efficiency, loves efficiency, because that's part of business. But the purpose of life isn't efficiency. The purpose of life is happiness. And your customer happiness is a lot more than efficiency. So this is our job future. And with that, we'll have some questions very soon. On the left, you see the stat from The Economist, clearly showing what's happening. Anything that's routine is not a good idea. Yeah, Non-routine cognitive work up and non-routine manual work. That's carpenters, plumbers. It's very hard to fix your toilet with a robot. Yeah? But the banking relationships, you know, looking at funding and investment, a good robot could be quite helpful there, right? up to a certain level, right? like TripAdvisor kind of. Right? So this is the skills of the future. You have to teach your kids and yourself. And this is how you're going to become indispensable. Point number one here is, of course, creativity always has been, especially for us. But the next one is critical thinking. You know, 10 years ago, if you would have gone to a major company and you said you should hire more people who are critical thinkers, they would have said, no, they're absolutely not. We don't want people with emotions. We don't want people throwing sand in the gearbox. Right? But Picasso already said, computers are really stupid. They only have answers. We want people who ask questions. So these are the people you got to hire. 
people who are saying, we're going to do things differently. The second, uh, third one, most importantly, emotional intelligence. We talked about this earlier in the, in the other talk, right? Actually, to have emotional intelligence, that's not something you can just stuff in like a program, like a chip, right? So let's use technology, but let's, let's put more emphasis on the human things. I sometimes call this exponential humanity, uh, just like exponential technology. So the end of routine, uh, especially, you know, if you're planning the next 10 years, anything that's routine in your company, get rid of it using technology because somebody else will do it otherwise. This is the key to the future. So as a summary, this is where we're going. Our world is rapidly connecting. We're rapidly getting more data and information and more machine heads. That is not going back. There's no way out here. We're not going to say, well, let's put the tech back in the box. That's just not going to happen. Yeah, you can opt out if you're rich or Amish. But the other thing is really important. That let's put the human back inside in what we're doing. This is a really important question. So finally, as, as a word of advice, you know, using automation, robotics, and technology, let's give the routines to machines. But that doesn't include many things that are important to us, right? We don't delegate trust or relationships or emotions through machines. Positive psychology says this is really why we're, why we're happy. This is Martin Zinnigman, you may have heard about his work as a psychologist. Positivity, engagement, relationships, meaning, accomplishment. You know, in today's digital life, we often say that loneliness kills because loneliness is actually something that we have in social networks now in a different way because we don't have relationships. So very important to keep that in mind. I think this is where we're going. As a final word, I want to say this. Very, very important. We have to use technology to get better at what we're doing. We have to use technology to be quicker, faster, more efficient, but we don't want to embrace it. Uh, we don't want to become it, sorry. <laughs> That's a good Freudian mistake, right? Uh, so embrace technology, but don't become it. That simply means we use technology, but we stay clear of becoming it ourselves and becoming too close so we can't live without it. I want to thank you very much for listening. And I uh, want to close with a quote of my mentor, David Bowie, uh, who said shortly before his death, rest in peace, the future belongs to those that can hear it coming. I think if you can hear the future coming, you'll be safe in that future, and the same I would wish for your kids. Thanks for listening. Thank you.